your dream home and are ready to sign on the dotted line of that OTP? Well, tonight we talk everything you need to know before you put that offer to purchase in. This is the Private Property Podcast. My name is Tumi. Let's unpack. My guest tonight is Gary. at Stegman's Incorporated. We're going to be talking everything and anything you need to know before you sign that OTP. Gareth, good evening and thank you so much for joining us. Hi to me. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. So I just found my dream home and I'm ready to put in that offer to purchase so that I can move in. What are some of the things that I need to Start with a title deed. The title deed is what tells you who the current owner is, what type of property it is, uh, what title conditions or anything there are. So if you're looking to, to enter into an OTP and you, you want to maybe draft it yourself, if you, you haven't got a, a state agent or even if the state agent comes to you and you want to check it, you should always check it against the title deed just to mm -hmm. ensure that the, that the nature of the, the owner is correct. Sometimes people think they own a property, but it's actually... Uh, for example, in a company or a trust, uh, instead of the, the, the owner's name, uh, personal name, and mm. uh, the property description and uh, things like that. So we would always start with the, with the, with the title deed and perhaps a deed search uh, just to check exactly what the true status is of the property and the ownership. And is there a standard process that's followed for, for all properties or when one is, is, is starting and embarking on the process of, of putting in an offer to purchase? And how long and particularly is this, is this process? Okay, it's, well, uh, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> you, can't, you can't really uh, put, a, put a, a time frame to, to property transactions because everyone's unique. And therefore, to your first question as to uh, what was the process that we would, we would follow, um, when uh, entering into an offer to purchase, an offer to purchase is, is made by the, the, the purchaser to the seller. When the seller accepts, it becomes a deed of sale and is uh, able to be registered in the deeds office. In other words, the transfer of ownership is able to be registered. So, so the process would basically be to determine the nature of, and description of the property, as I mentioned before, the, the uh, nature of the seller whether they're company, trust, whatever it is. And the same would apply to the purchaser. Are you going to buy it in your own name? Or are you going to buy it in a, in a trust, in a company? Um, you need to decide who, who's going to be the owner. Uh, and then you would obviously need to know the purchase price. Um, and not only need to know the purchase price, you would know how it's going to be paid. Is there going to be a 10% deposit, 20% deposit, zero deposit? Um, and is the balance going to be financed or uh, from the sale of another house? Um, so you would need to know not only the purchase price, but how uh, you're going to pay it. Uh, then you would uh, perhaps put in some suspensive conditions. And suspensive conditions are basically conditions that hold up the contract um, and temporarily, hopefully, um, until they are fulfilled. If they are not fulfilled, the contract falls away and becomes null and void. Mm -hmm. um, if I can give you an example, the most obvious example is that it's subject to finance. So... Uh, if I can get a bond for the 80% that I owe above the deposit, um, then the transfer will proceed. If I don't, it falls away and uh, my deposit is paid back to me and the um, seller can go and uh, try and find another uh, purchaser. So yeah, and then every transaction is unique. So sometimes there's a few special conditions, uh, maybe relating to the fixtures or fittings or something like that. So yeah, that's that, that would be the, the basic process in, in entering into a an offer to purchase, and as I said, that becomes your deed of sale. Um, at some times, or in some instances, um, individuals are doing this themselves. You mentioned earlier that property practitioners sometimes are not involved in this process of um, one entering into offer to purchase. What advice would you give to somebody who is facilitating this process themselves? My first advice would be, don't do it. <laughs> 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 the, the, the second uh, thing is, okay, in all seriousness, you should get um, expert uh, assistance, whether that be through an attorney or an experienced estate agent, um, you're better off to have someone who has done many, 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 many transactions rather than try and, and do it yourself. But if you're going to do it yourself, bear in mind those elements that are I discussed earlier the, the nature of the parties, the description of the property, the purchase price, how it will be paid, and so on. Mm -hmm. And then look very carefully at whatever example you're going to use for your offer to purchase. 
and make sure that you get it from a reputable source. Um, I'm sure that private property has got many resources that they, that they make available, um, but there, are, there, there could be some or one or two others. Don't get it from your um, mother's uncle who once sold a house uh, 20, 30 years ago. The law changes on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, make sure you've got an up-to-date um, example that you're going to use um, if you decide to do your own. But as I said, keep that as a final resort. Um, most estate agents, um, if you're selling your property through an estate agent, yes, you'll pay um, uh, agent's commission. Um, but I think it, it could be uh, well worthwhile in the end. Um, and also, if, you, if, you're not, if you've got a private sale, rather go to an attorney. Most attorneys, if they're going to do the transfer, don't charge uh, too much or sometimes even give uh, away the offer to purchase for free um, uh, on the basis that they will uh, be uh, billing for the, the transfer. Sure. No, definitely. And thank you so much for that. You know, um, we, we've heard is at these brag conversations or by the grapevine that most people want to do um, private sales because they think um, uh, property practitioners are going to take money away from me and they're going to give me less. You know, what obligations do property practitioners have to those people who are actually selling homes? And are there specific things that they are meant to have in terms of um, the offer to purchase? Look, I think you need to make sure that your property practitioner is a registered property practitioner um, in, with a, uh, I think it's a property practitioners council or something now, the old uh, EIB, Estate Agents Affairs Board. Um, and you need to definitely make sure that they have a valid fidelity fund certificate um, in order to ensure that it's a legitimate and reputable agent that you're dealing with. Um, we hear so many stories of, of agents taking a deposit or something and, and, and uh, moving off with it. And the same actually applies to attorneys. I'm, I'm very sad to report. Mm -hmm. That, that, that there are horror stories out there and you can only do your own uh, due diligence on the um, experts that you choose to use, whether that's an estate agent or an attorney or any other person in the process, a, a valuer, a, a property inspector, a bond originator, whatever it is that you use, you, you can, uh, in these, this day and age, relatively easy verify, verify their reputation and also just see that they have the, the valid certificates and so on in order. Sure. Um, you know, coming to the actual contracts or coming to the actual um, clauses that are involved in the contracts or of the offer to purchases, there's often a 72 hour provision that is given um, to to that is used in contracts, you know, or rather that provides information for for people who are actually um, who that facilitates that conversation. Um, are there any other things or any other clauses that uh, that should be in the offer to purchase that sometimes um, one should look out for to understand exactly how the offer to purchase is supposed to be? OK, um, look, ob obviously, the, if we just go first into the 72 hour clause, the 72 hour clause basically says that if you have a offer that is subject to suspensive conditions, then the seller can take other offers. And if they receive an offer that is not subject to any suspensive conditions, then the person in the, the buyer in the first offer must immediately perform. In other words, uh, if it's suspensive upon the buyer uh, putting down a, a deposit uh, or, or something like that, or, or selling the other house, they must immediately perform um, within 72 hours. That's what's called that, that, that clause. And um, then the, the seller is obviously more advantageous for the seller to have a non-suspensive offer. So, so they would then move on to the second offer because it's highly unlikely that you either going to obtain finance or sell your house or whatever the suspensive condition is within 72 hours. So that's, so that's that, um, uh, that clause. Uh, regarding your question as to what other clauses people should look out for, the clause that is most subject to litigation, and if you, if you go and search Footstuarts and latent and patent defects, and, and even since the introduction of the Consumer Protection Act, it was meant to uh, clarify it to a certain extent. Um, there is such a vast amount of, of litigation from the beginning, I don't know, the early 1900s until now. Um, and it's quite obvious why that is, because uh, something that might be an obvious defect to me might not be an obvious defect to the next person. And um, it, so there's a, a debate erupts as to whether it's a latent patent or, or, or what kind of defect it is and, and whether the, uh, it's covered by the footstool clause or the Consumer Protection Act. So obviously that, that is a, a clause that leads to a lot of um, 
disputes between buyers and sellers and, and a lot of it ends up in the courts. Um, but I think the, the most important ones for me that, that people don't seem to realize is firstly that by signing the offer and accepting the offer, you're entering into a legally binding contract. Uh, it's, it's just because it's called an offer and not a uh, contract or an agreement of sale or something doesn't mean there's not legal consequences to you signing it. So please, please, please don't go signing things uh, and assume that there can be no consequences. In, in the law, generally, if you sign something, there are consequences. Mm. So, um, yeah, that's that's the one thing about it is 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 realize that when you sign and, and read all of the, the terms to to know what you're signing. Um, and the a second one is people often see the suspense of condition of obtaining finance as a, a route to get out of a, a, a deal. In other words, the, they, they enter into a deal uh, uh, and they, they find another house the next day that they would prefer. And, and then they, they, they say, oh, okay, now to suspense upon them getting finance, they couldn't get finance. If you don't try and get finance, the seller can still hold you to account. You've actually got to make an effort um, it's uh, called constructive fulfillment in, in law, but it basically means that, that, that if you undertake, you, can, you cannot rely on your own laziness or whatever as an excuse to escape a contract. <coughs> Sorry. Sure, such great insights there, and I'm already learning a lot, and it looks, um, well, the... The, the assumption a lot of times is that only the, the buyer is protected. And I think now with what you're telling us now is that also the person who is selling the house can form or get some kind <coughs> of protection in terms of this agreement. What other things in terms of this, from the seller's perspective, would they be able to, to, to get protection from? Like in terms of um, that, that offer to purchase. Once they have received the offer to purchase, can they start um, looking at this as, as a done deal? Well, once they accept the offer to purchase, yes, they can start looking at it as a, as a done deal. Uh, as I said, there could be suspensive conditions that hold up the implementation of the, of the contract. Um, and if those conditions are, are legitimately not fulfilled, then um, both parties would walk away. And uh, in, in law, we use a nice Latin term, um, null and void ab initio. And ab initio basically means from the beginning. So, so it was, would be as if the, the, the contract never existed and the parties are entitled to be restored. Again, there's another Latin term to the status quo ante, which basically means to the status quo before. Uh, in other words, the position they were in before they ever signed anything. Sure. Now let's just bring it back for um, the, the seller <laughs> in terms of what, what are some of those reasons that they could decline? On which basis could they now decline or some of the things that they need to they need to look out for in the offer to purchase that can allow them to decline or um, see if a deal might just go south from a seller's perspective okay. that is from the from the seller's perspective okay um look the, 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 we've 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 already discussed the the 72 hour clause yeah. um there are other there's a, there's a clause uh, cooling off clause is, is generally what it's uh, called where it says that um, if within five days the seller wants to walk away, they can. Um, generally, that clause is either inserted uh, uh, in terms of Section 29A of the Alienation of Land Act, um, which means that the value of the, of the transaction must be less than 250,000 Rand. And as you know, in this day and age, there's a really, really uh, 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 property transaction below that value. Mm -hmm. um, or alternatively, in terms of Section 16 of the Consumer Protection Act, uh, which um, also allows the, the, the purchaser to uh, walk away from the, the contract uh, within five days. Um, but again, there, there, are, there are conditions in the contract, like for example, it must be as a result of direct marketing and, and others that, that, that would allow the, the, the seller to escape. As we've just discussed all along now is generally, once you've signed something, there are consequences. And, uh, and yes, there are always loopholes and, and so on, and uh, clever attorneys might find a, a, a gap for you, but don't count on it. Sure. No, thank you so much for, for such great insights, Gareth. And just any more advice before we wrap up our conversation tonight? Yes, uh, always read the contract, whether it's your own attorney, your own estate agent, your own, uh, you did it yourself, well, obviously you're gonna read it if you did it yourself, 
or, or the example that you're using and, and read every clause because yes, a lot of them are standard. And um, for example, it says, if it applies to a male, it applies to a female, one gender and the other. Um, those are all standard clauses and they're in, in all the contracts and that, but just read through everyone just to make sure there's, there's nothing hidden in there that, it, that could be to your detriment. And if you can obtain expert advice. Well, thank you so much for that. And you know, you don't want to turn um, a dream home into a nightmare. So thank you so much for the insights that you've given us tonight and have a good evening. Thank you very much to me. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. And that's how we wrap up the conversation tonight. Read that offer to purchase through and through, whether you are the buyer or you are the seller. <laughs> ensure that you know exactly what you're getting yourself into. And remember, the right amount of property information might just be what you need to get yourself back on that property A game. Thank you so much for joining us tonight as we talk everything and anything property. Till we see you again right here on the Private Property Podcast. Have a good night.